So we'll now move from uh, Elena's background on uh, the history of Ukraine to uh, Sergei taking on some of the geopolitics of Russia and uh, the new Cold War in uh, Eastern Europe. Sergei uh, Plech Plekhanov, uh, uh, who uh, was educated at the uh, Moscow State Institute of International Relations uh, and holds a PhD in history uh, from the Institute of the Study of the U.S. and Canada in the Academy of Sciences of the old USSR. Uh, he's one of my colleagues at the Department of Political Science in York University as director of the South and Central Asia Project at, at York. Uh, he has written widely on a whole set of issues of the post-communist transformation in Russia and Eastern Europe and is one of the most well-known commentators on these issues in Canada. Thank you, Greg. So, this has been uh, a very, very uh, good way of introducing uh, you to the factory politics of Ukraine. And uh, there are countries which uh, have, uh, you know, big issues with, uh, with their uh, capacity to maintain some sort of a consensus which would prevent political conflicts which are always there to some degree or another. Uh, from from actually uh, generating a civil war. In Ukraine, unfortunately, we have had a political conflict which originally was centered on a foreign policy decision, the decision of President Yanukovych, who actually made a tremendous contribution to the work between the European Union and Ukraine uh, toward signing uh, an agreement of association between uh, EU and, and Ukraine. And, and uh, the same president at the last moment decided to postpone the signing uh, because the terms, the economic terms that Europe was offering were not sufficient uh, from the point of view of the national interest of Ukraine. So it wasn't an issue of bye bye Europe, I'm going to be in bed with Russia. No. Uh, Yanukovych was in the same uh, tradition of all Ukrainian leaders uh, since 1991, trying to balance its uh, involvement with the West and, and with Russia. However, the, the opposition, the nationalist opposition in Ukraine, uh, virtually declared a political war for Yanukovych uh, over uh, this foreign policy issue. And uh, what followed was uh, the uh, familiar sight in Ukraine, uh, politics of the street, uh, opposition forces managing to uh, deploy enough uh, bodies uh, in front of the government buildings and camping out, uh, clashing with the police and so on. Uh, it was difficult to imagine when this conflict was escalating in uh, December of uh, 2013, then January, and uh, the standoff continued, and the attempts to resolve the, uh, the conflict by means of some kind of a compromise between the government and the opposition were, were failing. It was difficult to imagine that a few months later uh, it would be a situation of civil war. Now, why? How could Ukraine slide into a civil war? The costs of the civil war, by the way, uh, are enormous. Uh, the official data uh, from the United Nations on the number of people killed in the Ukrainian conflict since uh, February, late February of, of 1914 is 6,000. But unofficial estimates, in particular one coming from the German intelligence service, puts the number at 50,000. And that was from a report that was leaked to the media in Germany uh, in, uh, in, in February of this year. Uh, apparently, the 6,000 figure includes only the civilians, uh, victims of, uh, of the war. And the rest of the figure of 50,000 includes the, the actual fighters on both sides, the Ukrainian army and the rebel forces of eastern Ukraine. Now, Ukraine has some, it's been a massive tragedy for the country because uh, apart from the loss of life, Ukraine, the Ukrainian state has been shattered. Ukraine has lost some territory. The governability of the country has declined to a very, very low point. Uh, its economy has contracted by one-fifth and uh, uh, it's actually, right now, it's on the brink of default. It may actually default on, uh, on, on, its, uh, on its debt. 
uh, because its economy is uh, continuing to slide into uh, depression and there's simply no money to repay the debt. Uh, the Ukraine crisis was had important international dimensions to begin with. As I've mentioned, it starts with a foreign a debate, a dispute over a foreign policy decision. And uh, it's not surprising that uh, external actors were involved in the crisis from day one. The West, Russia, even before the annexation of Crimea, which was, of course, uh, uh, an extreme uh, point of, of this foreign involvement. Uh, if the West had not supported the Ukrainian opposition, the Yanukovych government would not have been overthrown. I mean, it's obvious from, from uh, any objective analysis, reading of the objective analysis of, of the circumstances of the uh, of the overthrow of the government. It was a legitimate government which was democratically elected. It had a majority in the parliament and it was overthrown as a result of consistent attacks, militant attacks on the government precipitating uh, uh, violent clashes in a situation where every time the government would try to use force, against the protesters, there would be enormous pressure from the West. Don't do that, or else. So, uh, the, uh, the fact that both Russia and the West had important stakes in the outcome of that crisis made the Ukraine crisis uh, an international crisis. And uh, at this point, we're looking at the lowest point in relation between Russia and the West since the Cold War. And uh, uh, it can get worse. Cooperation between NATO and Russia is totally suspended. There's economic warfare. Sanctions, exchange of sanctions, is a form of economic warfare. Uh, and uh, there's propaganda warfare. And we're all experiencing that propaganda warfare because the Canadian media coverage of the crisis gives you anything but an objective picture of what's going on. In fact, I've been ashamed of the way even some of the best, some of the better journalists here have uh, managed to distort uh, to, uh, to omit important aspects, to, to spin the news in a sustained, systematic manner, which makes it a form of propaganda warfare. And on the Ukrainian and on the Russian side, there are their own forms of propaganda warfare. So, just as in the Cold War, the truth is the first victim of this conflict. Heightened military activities, which uh, Greg has already referred to, by the way, yesterday, according to a CNN report, a Russian fighter plane flew within three meters uh, of, of an American warplane over the Black Sea. Uh, uh, the last such incident took place uh, a couple of months ago, then the distance was six meters. I hope there won't be another uh, incident like that because they're getting perilously close to each other. Uh, but the fact is that, that uh, you know, the militaries on both sides are increasingly acting in this uh, kind of provocative mode, challenging each other. In the Cold War, there used to be the game of chicken between the mm. uh, nuclear submarines of uh, uh, the United States and Russia, where the skippers would be going straight toward the enemy submarine, and then uh, the enemy's uh, uh, skipper would be determined to hold on to the course, and whoever will swerve will be chicken. Mm -hmm. It was a matter of pride for naval officers not to, not to turn up. Uh, arms control and disarmament negotiations and the fate of treaties. Some of the important uh, arms reduction treaties are now hanging in suspension. Uh, suspension. We may see some some of them terminated. Uh, the uh, negotiations uh, uh, have uh, been suspended. The only kind of negotiations in this area uh, that are still going on are negotiations on Iran, where you have six major powers plus Iran uh, trying to forge an agreement to, which would effectively prevent the possibility that Iran might become a nuclear weapons state. So, a lively topic is this is a new Cold War. A new Cold War. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, some of the, uh, in the official circles, both East and West, there's a reluctance to call it uh, a new Cold War. And uh, the thing that you, the argument which you usually hear of why it's not a Cold War, they say, well, you know, it's no longer between communism and capitalism because Russia is a capitalist country. The ideological conflict is no longer there. A major dimension of 
Cold War was Russia's challenge to capitalism as a socialist state. Now, Russia has about abandoned socialism. Russia has integrated itself into the capitalist economy. It has a capitalist class, very powerful oligarchs, and so on and so forth. So that is supposed to make us sleep better because it's not a Cold War. Let me remind you that the two world wars of the 20th century started not between capitalist and, and socialist states, even though in the Second World War, of course, when Germany invaded the Soviet Union, it acquired that ideological dimension, but then immediately major capitalist powers, Britain and the United States, jumped to Russia's side, kind of underscoring the fact that the ideological dimension, while important, uh, dimension while important was not the main, it was a geopolitical conflict. So, a geopolitical conflict between the United States and China, between the United States and Russia, could escalate to, to prohibitive levels. So, whether or not it is a Cold War, which is an academic issue, our concern should be to prevent it from becoming a hot war. So, in the Ukrainian crisis, in the, when, we, when we look for causes of the Ukraine crisis, the internal causes, the fragility of the Ukrainian state, this constant warfare, political warfare between different oligarchs, between different parties, the regional splits, the cultural divisions that Halina was referring to are important. But without the international dimension, without the tendency, both in Russia and in the West, to view Ukraine in strategic geopolitical term, terms, regarding Ukraine as absolutely crucial for uh, the success of one side or, or another. Let me illustrate. Zbigniew Brzezinski, in a very influential text, which is called The Grand Chessboard, published in 1997, and uh, widely read by politicians, both in the West and in Russia, as a kind of a definitive text on the rules of modern geopolitics after the Cold War. Brzezinski writes in that text, Ukraine, a new and important space on the European chessboard, Eurasian chessboard, is a geopolitical pivot because its very existence as an independent country helps to transform Russia. Without Ukraine, Russia ceases to be a Eurasian empire. However, if Moscow regains control over Ukraine with its 52 million people, now 40, uh, the population has declined, also 2 million refugees as a result of, of this war, most of them, by the way, escaping to Russia. It's 52 million people and major resources, as well as access to the Black Sea. Russia automatically again regains the wherewithal to become a powerful imperial state spanning Europe and Asia. Uh, a Defense Department official in the senior Bush administration in 1991 uh, described Ukraine later in an interview uh, with an American historian, described the importance of Ukraine in this way. We had a view that without Ukraine, a retrograde Russia would never reconstitute the Soviet Union. It would never become the threat posed by the Soviet Union because of the enormous resources and population and geography of Ukraine. So that would become an important element of US policy, putting aside all the principles that were all important. From the strategic point, an independent Ukraine became an instrument, an insurance policy. An independent Ukraine, which means independent from Russia, doesn't mean that it should be independent from the West. No, if it's dependent on the West, that means independence, because only free nations join the West, as we all know. Uh, another very interesting quote. This, uh, this is very recent. George Friedman is the head of a famous uh, organization called Strategic Forecasting, or Stratfor. Uh, very influential, non-government organization in, in Chicago, which pro provides on a daily basis analysis of important world events. Having visited Moscow in uh, January of this year, Friedman, uh, uh, on a, during the visit to Moscow, he gave an interview where he was quite frank about uh, the zero-sum game that is inevitable between Russia and the West over Ukraine. This is how he put it in that Moscow interview. At the beginning of this year, there existed in Ukraine a slightly pro-Russian, though very shaky government. That situation was fine for Moscow. After all, Russia did not want to completely control Ukraine or occupy it. It was enough that Ukraine not join NATO and the EU. This is, by the way, correct. The, uh, the EU issue was manageable. 
Russian authorities cannot tolerate a situation in which Western armed forces are located a hundred or so kilometers from Kursk or Voronezh. These are major Russian cities in Western Russia. The United States, for its part, was interested in forming a pro-Western government in Ukraine. It saw that Russia was on the rise and was eager to let it consolidate, it was eager not to let it consolidate its position in the post-Soviet space. The success of the pro-Western forces in Ukraine would allow the United States to contain Russia. <laughs> Russia calls the events that took place at the beginning of this year, I mean, he was speaking in, in December 94, so it was referring to the winter of 19, uh, 13, 14. At the beginning of this year, a coup d'etat organized by the United States. Uh, one party here wants a Ukraine, that, meaning uh, Russia versus the United States. One party wants a Ukraine that is neutral. The other wants Ukraine to form part of a line of containment against Russian expansion. <coughs> one cannot say that either party is mistaken. <coughs> Both are acting based on their national interests. It's just that these interests don't jive. <coughs> The bottom line is that it is in the strategic interests of the United States to prevent Russia from becoming a hegemon. And it is in the interests, in the strategic interests of Russia, not to allow the United States to come to its border. I don't think you can put it in, in, in simpler terms. Uh, but this describes the American perspective. What about the perspective of the Europeans? The Angela Merkel and uh, Francois Hollande, the, the, the Europeans in general. In a remarkable new study of the Ukrainian crisis, written by Richard Sakwa, a highly respected British academic specializing in Russia and Ukraine, it's called Frontline Ukraine, highly recommended book. Uh, he, said, he actually criticizes uh, the European Union for pursuing a policy with regard to expanding the Union eastward uh, in a way which would exclude Russia in effect denying that Russia had any legitimate interest in uh, the former republics of the Soviet Union to the west of Russia, Ukraine being the most important case. So, uh, Sakwa describes it as, uh, in, in terms of two possible projects of Euro European expansion, one is wider Europe, the other is greater Europe. Now, wider Europe was the project adopted by the European Union. Wider Europe means that Brussels remains in charge, remains in charge. So Brussels, con Brussels continues to expand the realm of the European Union, enforcing the rules of the European Union, further and further eastward, and Russia would just have to swallow it and adapt to it. Now, the greater Europe uh, is based on a different premise, and it uh, uh, recognizes that some multiple polars, poles of, of power and influence in new region. So if you want to incorporate Russia in a greater Europe, you have to respect Russian sovereignty, Russia's interests, and so on. You can't regard the Russians as, you guys are in the way, why don't you just move over? Because we are expanding into Ukraine. So he writes in his book, instead of concentric rings emanating from Brussels, weakening at the edges, but nevertheless focused on a single center, greater Europe posits a multipolar vision with more than one center, without a single ideological flavor. This is a pluralistic representation of European space and draws on a long European tradition, the vision of pan-European unification. So, if the European expansion project had been based on the notion, on, the, on the, this view of greater Europe, which is inclusive and pluralistic, as opposed to wider Europe, which is very monistic and very much hegemonistic from the point of view of, of uh, the EU, uh, Ukraine crisis would not have become the tragedy that, that it became. So, we're looking at a zero-sum game between Russia and the West. And uh, it's obvious to anyone uh, who knows anything about Ukraine that if you play zero-sum geopolitical games over Ukraine, that destroys Ukraine. That destroys Ukraine. Uh, ten more. Uh, and uh, why? Uh, but but why should why should anybody? If if there are big geopolitical issues involved, if this is a game, uh, or if it's, this is a policy which is aimed at preventing the rise of Russia, 
preventing the strengthening of Russia, the increase in the influence of Russia, even though Russia is not interested in zero-sum games. It wants a new balance of power, right? But if, if you're interested in that, then, well, you know, Libya, we sacrificed Libya, right? Because there was an important geopolitical project there. We can sacrifice Ukraine. We, it may be that Ukraine has already been sacrificed as a state. To the greater goal of the expansion of the West uh, at the expense of Russia. So, uh, now, the deeper meaning about the, of, of, of this conflict is that it's an attempt of the Western elites to prevent the erosion of Western power. And that erosion is going on. We know it. This world is sliding toward a different distribution of political and economic power. It's called multipolarity, polycentrism. China is rising. The center of global, so is India, so is Brazil. The distributional power in the world is going to be more pluralistic. It's not going, the West is not going to be able to maintain the stranglehold that it has, the dominance that it has. And it, in fact, it was a false perception of what happened in 1991, when as a result of the Soviet Union being dissolved, by its own leaders, by the way, it was not dissolved by the uprising of the people. It was dissolved by the bureaucrats of the second rank of the Soviet uh, Communist Party and state bureaucracy with the Russians and the Ukrainians leading the way in an amicable deal. Hey, you know, we don't need the Soviet Union. We can be bosses within our, no, our own republics and let them be independent state. <laughs> no, no bad feeling toward each other. It's a shared interest. And then we both integrate into the global economy in Western terms, you know, according to our own interests and uh, uh, peculiarities. So, the, this transition to a multipolar world is the big trend. And uh, the Ukraine crisis, if, uh, if Ukraine, if, if the government of Yanukovych had not been overthrown, Ukraine would have continued to balance between the West and Russia, but with increasing uh, emphasis on the maintenance and development of ties, not just with Russia, but also with the new integrative structure that is being built around Russia, and that's called the Eurasian Economic Union, which is patterned after the European Union. Very similar terms, except, except that Russia is the driving force there. But it's not just about uh, reintegration of Soviet space, it's also about the growing alliance between Russia and China, which is going to be joined by India. By the way, uh, in July of this year, in a few weeks, uh, in the city of Ufa, the capital of Tatarstan, one of the Repub Islamic republics of Russia, there will be a summit of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which was created by Russia, Europe, and uh, Russia, China, and, and four Central Asian states, to promote regional cooperation. A and the big decision that is expected there is the admission of India and Pakistan into this group. Imagine the implications. This is not a military alliance. This is a cooperative regional arrangement is focused primarily on the issues of the economy, social policy, infrastructure development, and so on and so forth, as well as security. So, uh, uh, the uh, interesting thing is that this uh, summit of SCO might, be less, might have been less dramatic if the West has not chosen, had not chosen to punish Russia for its action on Ukraine. In fact, the West with its policy of sanctions and threats and so on, has pushed Russia away from the West. Mm. Thinking that if you push Russia away from the West, then Russia has nowhere to go. How short-sighted. Mm. By the way, I'm reminded of a book by a Western, uh, by a West German historian written in the 1960s with a very characteristic title. Russia minus the West equals zero. And it's actually, the, the whole text is devoted to the importance of the European ideas in the rise and development of the Russian state, which is, by the way, about 1,200 years old. And indeed, yes, Russia has uh, imported a lot of ideas, not only from the West, but also from the East. But being a great Eurasian state, it has very important other interests than selling gas to the European Union. In fact, we're now witnessing a possibility that Russia might, might stop selling gas to the European Union 
all together and okay let them buy liquefied gas from the United States and pay twice the price but then it will be all within the unified West which is protecting its sacred borders from, uh, from Russian threats uh, because there are big markets in the East. So the, the interesting thing here is that uh, this, uh, uh, this conflict between Russia and the West is recognized by both sides as something which is not desirable, and yet that's something that is inevitable. Which reminds me of the mindset of many political leaders of 1914. Nobody really wanted the big war. And at the same time, they were acting as if such a war was inevitable. So action, reaction, process, how can I not respond, says Obama, uh, in, in response to uh, the decision of Russia to annex Crimea, based on the uh, free expression of the uh, will of the people, but still annexation. So how, that's an intolerable threat to the world order, a blow to the world order. So whoever does that must be punished, all right? Okay, then, but, so what would be the Russian response? Yes, sorry, we did that, but we had to do that because we had an important interest involved and so on. We didn't want NATO to capture uh, Crimea, which might have been the case if we had not intervened, and so on and so forth. But expecting that Russia will be meekly accepting the Western punishment without responding, without doing anything in other directions of its foreign policy was very short-sighted. So the <laughs> process of the devolution of world power, which to some degree, I would say to a great degree, uh, precipitated the Ukraine crisis, has actually received new impetus from that crisis. So it is the growing rift between Russia and the West, which I'm sure can be repaired because both sides are very wary of allowing the conflict to escalate much too much because we're looking at really massive nuclear arsenals on both sides, right? Deployable uh, uh, on a minute's notice. Uh, if, but this rift which is growing is actually a manifestation of the global transformation. It's not just a public rift. It's not just about Russia and the West. It's about the world which is falling out from Western influence. And I think that it is difficult, it's difficult for me to imagine any major event that would reverse this process. So the choices for the West are to gradually <coughs> adapt to this shift and manage it, making sure that its interests are not unduly damaged in the process. Uh, the other option is to be ready for a war. Yeah. And I think that any sign uh, and any sane uh, political leaders would prefer it. And I think that, again, that remains the preferred choice. But things may get out of hand despite what our leaders have in mind, despite their best plans and so on. Because Ukraine has over 40 million people. It's the second largest country in Europe in terms of territory. And there's a civil war continuing there. And we should be thinking about ways of bringing that civil war to a negotiated end, and a possibility exists, it can be done. But it can only be done if the leaders in Washington and Moscow sit down and forge a deal. Thank you.